the recording going. Excellent. Yep. Well, welcome to the Branding Guidelines and Imagery webinar. And we're here with uh, Renee Beckerblau with Indiana First, so hi teams. And Chris, do you want to introduce yourself? Yep. Hello, everybody. Chris Osborne, Program Director. Looking forward to learning about this stuff, too. Perfect. And we have our guest speaker here. And Chris, if you'd like to go to the next slide. So we have Jason Penrod from Renaissance Electronic Services. Who Hello. Works. So Jason, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what you do with Renaissance? Sure. Um, I am Renaissance's content strategist. So basically, I'm responsible for uh, planning and writing uh, any written content. Um, that's ebooks, customer stories, uh, the content for the website, emails, things like that. Fantastic. That sounds very exciting. Uh, so today, you know, this year we have a number of new rookie teams and, you know, every season our teams you know, can do some cool and fun things with their brand. And so we thought it made a lot of sense to talk a little bit about team branding. And so Chris, if you could go to the, the next slide, um, let's start with, you know, just going over what a brand is. Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of people think of brands as uh, you know, the, the logo for a company, um, the font, what colors you choose, things like that. Uh, but really brand is anything that distinguishes your company from your competitors. Um, that can be the architecture of your building, that can be the design of your software, um, that can be uh, uniforms for your employees, things like that. So really anything that uh, makes the consumer recognize you as a company is your brand. Got it. And so when you look at like a first team, a brand could be considered, you know, from t-shirts and uh, giveaways and what all the robot looks to kind of things like that. Right. Um, so I think that like the teams that I've seen that do branding really well, um, your branding pretty much touches everything. It's not just, um, the shirts and kind of the pamphlets that you hand out. It's also like pit decoration, uh, what the robot looks like. Um, maybe it's costumes, maybe it's um, like a chant or something in the, the bleachers, but there's like a consistent theme that goes on. Perfect. Uh, and so, you know, Chris, let's move to the next slide, but why is branding actually important for a company? Um, so the big thing is that it helps uh, us as the consumer remember that these companies exist um, in kind of the example that's up on the, the slide. Uh, it makes me remember that if I want a cup of coffee, that Starbucks is a place that I can go. Um, the other thing is that um, kind of like how I, I said that brand could be a uniform, that's probably the best example of what branding is. Um, when you go to a store, you see someone in a uniform, you know that that's a person that's going to help you out. It's that consistency that gives the consumer a little bit of trust towards the brand. Um, so when I see a consistent brand or a consistent logo, I know that I have some expectation involved in that product. Um, the other thing is that depending upon the strength of your branding, it's going to help you um, maybe stand out from your competitors. Um, in the case of my company, uh, we do software for the dental industry, which is a particularly exciting or fun um, industry to, to do marketing for. Um, the tendency for a lot of brands is to do you know, a lot of photos of people with doctors with hands and mouths or like x-rays of teeth. Um, our decision was to do a lot more uh, illustrations and do a lot of superhero themes. So doing something different can kind of help make you stand out from the crowd of a lot of people doing the same thing. Perfect. Uh, so Chris, let's move to the next slide, but how does a clear brand um, help a first team. And I have a couple t-shirt examples that we could pull from too. Okay. Um, so, and, and I've, I've seen the kilobytes before. The, the thing that I really like about them and kind of to that point of building a rec recognizable identity, um, 
when people think of their logo for first, I think you see like a lot of rivets, you see um, a lot of kind of over design logos. And I think that's just a tendency that everybody has. That's a problem within uh, big companies that have millions of dollars going to design work. But what's great about the Kilobytes logo, um, there's a rule that if you're, if you want your logo to look great, it needs to look great in a single color. Um, you can see the Kilobytes logo from a distance and know exactly who they are. Um, the teeth and the circle are, is super recognizable. So if you're at a point where you're either redesigning your logo or um, for the newer teams that are designing a logo for the first time, try to create a logo that's as simple as possible that um, can be shrunk down um, to maybe just like a bullet point on a shirt or maybe it can be blown up to a banner. Um, it just that it consistently looks good in a single color is important. Sure. And Chris, if you want to switch back to the um, t-shirts better, um, I think that that might help. Uh, no, that's some of the like things you, that you know, 10, uh, 24 did really well um, was some of the like consistency and branding. So mm -hmm. if you recall going to events and seeing their pit display, right. Um, you could really see oh, their, yeah. um, uh, you know, the pit when you walk through the yeah. different areas. So we, we put kind of really over, out and it's consistent we in terms of over here, swing through. So like out over this way, we're about 20 inches. So I also have a cheesy poofs shirt. So I remembered what you said about cheesy poofs when we were talking. Right. Um, so one of the things that I. I notice in a lot of teams, and, and a lot of this is probably carryover from when uh, a lot of teams just got started uh, in first. Um, there are a ton of team names that have Robo in the name or Robot, or and, and that's just a very consistent theme. Um, so you see tons of teams with that kind of name. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that really stand out and the ones that everybody remembers are the ones that are kind of weird like Cheesy Puffs. Um, I only heard that name once last year when I judged and that has stuck in my head ever since. Um, I think there was another team that you had mentioned, which is, oh, Exploding Bacon. Yep. Um, so I, again, I just read that for the first time two days ago. I'm never not going to remember Exploding Bacon. So try to, if you're coming up with a new name for yourself, um, try to do something different than what everybody else is doing because it helps people like me remember your name. You know, absolutely. Well, and I think we have a couple with Exploding Bacon and Cheesy Poofs at least. Um, we'll, we'll have a couple more examples because they have some really great resources out there for teams that we'll touch base on too. Um, and then one of the other things you mentioned um, is, you know, in terms of, you know, kind of making it fun as well. And maybe we're a little ahead, but um, you know, branding to different events, right? And so this last year we had first power up, mm -hmm. which was kind of this arcade game. And so you can kind of see that the Hatters Robotics, they did an arcade game themed logo. Right. And so it was a little bit different um, this past year. And so that's kind of a way where, you know, you're encompassing some of the theme for the season, mm -hmm. right? And so Andy Mark, you know, they're one of our you know, in addition to Renaissance, one of our big supporters, but this, they have this new shirt that really focused on the space theme this year, which is something, you know, that first has across all four of their programs right. this season. So um, they kind of use their branding and brought space into it, which is a cool piece. Yeah. So if, if you do have the budget for it and you can design a new logo or design a, a new style of shirt, try, try to do something like that. Try to um, keep it fresh every year. Um, Certainly, as from a judge's perspective, the the teams that try to incorporate the the annual theme of first um, really helps to stand out. Like you've you've done a little bit extra effort in trying to uh, brand yourself that year. Absolutely. Well, and also, I'm I'm sure it makes it easier to create marketing materials if you've kind of built in the specific brand mm -hmm. because it takes less time to create these things because you have these standards that have been created. Right. So if you spend the time to kind of create uh, guidelines for your brand, like what colors you're using, uh, the types of fonts that you're using, um, maybe a consistent logo or a style that um, really is yours, it makes it easier for 
if someone that isn't a designer is responsible for uh, programming your website, um, they can kind of just reference your, your brand guidelines and, and create a website for you that looks consistent for your brand. Um, or if you were to uh, show like you order some t-shirts from a company like locally, um, you can show your logo or things like that. And like, this is the color that I need. This is the font that I use. Can you make this? Um, it's basically a tool to equip people that are not necessarily responsible for branding to stay consistent with branding. Awesome. All right. Well, let's, let's talk about actual branding guidelines. And so, you know, Chris, if you can help us pull up um, the website that we had sent over on um, Frontify with Renaissance's information, we can kind of pull up some of those details and information pieces. Um, so when we talk about branding guidelines, mm -hmm. high level, um, what does that typically look like? And we can kind of show this here. Right. So, um, I'm kind of going to say the opposite of what I said earlier, where the brand is everything outside of logo and typography and color palette, because it is super important that your brand is represented in your logo, your typography and color palette. But um, so Renaissance, my company, um, because we are a company of like 150 employees, we um, deal with a lot of outside vendors to create materials for us. We have a, a development team of um, 40, 50 people that are responsible for um, keeping a consistent look for us that need resources like our logo, like our typography, like our colors. These are all things that, um, like I said, consistency is important in building trust with the consumer um, that we need to make accessible for them. So our brand center is really where um, our brand guidelines live. So that's where, like, um, if you click on logo, that's where our logo lives in the different styles of our logo. Um, so you, people really think of just your logo as like a single symbol and that's kind of all that it is. Um, really, you need to provide people with examples of like, well, this is what the mark looks like by itself. This is what it looks like. Um, formatted this way, um, against this color, this color, or this color, um, just so you have variations on, so um, like a developer or say like a t-shirt company or something like that knows what to do with your logo um, depending upon its usage. Uh, typography um, may or may not be super important for uh, first teams because more than likely you're going to um, keep pretty consistent fonts, probably something that's like sans serif, like a Helvetica or something like that. Um, it's just important to keep some consistency. So if you, in all of your marketing materials, if like you have a bunch of papers that are all written in Helvetica, um, your website can't be Times New Roman, can't be Comic Sans, um, don't be all over the place because then it just starts to look sloppy. Um, and that translates to someone that's reading this material thinking that it's kind of sloppy. Um, well, and something that's really helpful too, a lot of these teams will work on like Google documents mm -hmm. to try and share materials. And so it's always really nice when your topography can be found in Google Docs right. and then also shared across other pieces. It doesn't necessarily mean that for like your logo, you couldn't use some sort of unique branding, but mm -hmm. it gets really hard to request schools to install fonts on computers sometimes. Um, so, so that's another good tip as well. Yeah. And, you know, the, while you will find fonts that probably get you super excited and you're going to um, think, oh, this is going to be really cool for a logo, um, my recommendation is to do something really basic for something that's meant to be read. Um, if it is the text of a document that you're handing out to people or if it's the text of your website, um, do something like Arial or Helvetica or Open Sans, something that's super simple like what's in front of me um, because it makes it hard to read and you don't want it, people to have to work to, to learn about you. Um, the other thing to, to keep in mind is like your color palette. Um, if you can click that. Um, so we make a point to kind of define those colors for, for our um, 
uh, development team. That way uh, we can maintain a consistent look for our product. Um, you will probably have whatever colors are um, determined by your school already. Um, but the main thing is that if you have a blue or if you have a red or whatever color defines your team, um, that you keep it consistent. Um, if you, you know, you, all of your stuff is like red and your robot is pink, um, you might not as an audience member know that that robot is, oh, that's probably, um, you know, 128 or whatever team it is. Um, you want to make sure that everything seems consistent so they can recognize you out in the crowd. Absolutely. And it's incredibly important when you uh, do like t-shirt ordering, uh, to the best of your ability, if you can stay with the same brand, it's really helpful. Um, there, so Wild Sting is an example of a robotics team um, that does tie-dye. And you will find that their shirts, depending on what like brand and marketing um, contact they're going through, like who they're ordering from, their tie-dye will change each year from mm -hmm. that. And for Wild Sting, that might not be quite a big a good deal. But for other teams, like the colors can change from one vendor to another, and that can get a little confusing sometimes too. Like if you're more black than orange, you know, whereas the other year you were more orange than black, if you were doing tie-dye, yeah. you know, that can always be interesting. Um, my, my recommendation if you're like getting shirts and stuff, um, if you have like a local vendor, like a local group that does shirts, um, a lot of those places, like a four imprint, places like that, uh, will have uh, kind of a showroom where you can see shirts before they're printed on and you can kind of determine like, oh, this looks good. This looks like our color. Um, the problem with ordering things online is if you don't get a sample, you never know what you're going to get. And um, it is definitely a case that you get what you pay for. And sometimes if you pay for something that's a little bit more budget friendly, um, you might get something that is the wrong color. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, and well, so in terms of a group of robotics students kind of starting off to create branding guidelines, mm -hmm. do you kind of have like a top couple areas that they should focus on just to start? Yeah. Um, Kind of like what I said earlier, uh, your, your brand touches everything. So when you're trying to come up with uh, a brand that kind of uh, encapsulates everything, like make sure that you're not just thinking about like, oh, this is gonna be a cool shirt or this is gonna look good on a website. Uh, think about like every part of your brand, be it how is this going to apply to a robot and make our robot stand out? How um, could we develop a chant that is related to um, whatever our mascot is? Um, can we create a recognizable mascot out of it? Um, just think of the different ways that your brand touches your team um, that isn't just you know, the colors, the logo, um, the name, things like that. Sure. So Chris, if you want to go back to the video, um, I, you know, I like that you kind of talked about exploding bacon earlier because one of the cool things that they do um, is they have a cheer. Okay. And so their cheer is oink, oink. And then the res response is boom. Okay. It was exploding bacon. Gotcha. Um, and so, so literally in the first world, teams and people will run into exploding bacon people at like the world championship, for instance, mm -hmm. and someone will say, oink, oink, and then the, all of the exploding bacon students will all yell, boom. Nice. Um, and so this, it's been proven. I, I happened to be on a school bus with a number of exploding bacon students going to a team social, and we yelled, oink, oink, from the back, and they all yelled, boom, and it was quite it was filled with joy um it was wonderful but so that was kind of a cool cheering mm -hmm. opportunity that they had um that they've incorporated really into their team along with obviously you know their the pig and uh, the rocket and all that fun stuff yeah so that that would be the other point that i would make is when you are trying to put together your brand for the first time um look at what everybody else is doing um at first, um, see you know what what all the other successful teams are doing. One, take note of the the brands that you really like. What what teams like? Uh, is it exploding bacon? Is it cheesy poofs? What whatever team it is that really excites you, um, do that 
or if you see a lot of your local teams kind of consistently doing like, well, we're uh, robo something or, um, you know, cyber something or et cetera, et cetera. Um, those that that's been done. Don't try to redo something that somebody else has done. Try to do the opposite of that. Do your own thing. Um, if you can't come up with something that's related to technology, go weird. Do the thing where you're like exploding bacon or cheesy poofs. Cheesy poofs. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like that. That's great. Um, Chris, if you want to throw back to the PowerPoint slides, I think we also talked a little bit about um, social media. And mm -hmm. so how does um, social media tie into this and, and part of like your larger uh, brand, you know, all together. One more slide, Chris. Thank you. Um, and so just, you know, can you talk a little bit about this? Like this is an example of what Indiana's first, you know, social media is, and that's a little bit easier. Yeah. But what are some suggestions maybe for teams to keep in mind? So. Um, really where, where social media is important, and this is the case for, um, you know, companies like ours and any major company is that social media is a, a tool for you to communicate what you want to um, your, your consumer. And um, in the case of a first team, really your, the, your main audience is people that you, you're hoping can donate money to you preferably um, either that's um, you know companies like mine or that is parents that may or may not um, know about uh, the program um, it's also a, a means for you to kind of evangelize first and be able to tell other students about it and show how much fun you're having um, but the important thing to potentially remember is uh, who your audience is um, I see a lot of teams use handles that are related to uh, their number, like the FRC, um, whatever. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Perfect example. Um, that is, and, and I know that there are two types of people within FIRST, like the people that remember the numbers and there are the people that remember the names. But if you're outside of FIRST, you just know names. Um, so if you're a potential parent or a potential donor or um, potentially a student that doesn't know much about FIRST but maybe kind of curious, they're not going to find you uh, if your handle is FRC12345. Um, it's better to do something like, uh, you know, Southport Robotics or uh, Team Cyber Blue or uh, Pike High School robotics, something like that, because those are the things that people are probably looking for, um, and they're more likely to find you that way. Um, the other thing to consider is what your different audiences for those different platforms. More than likely, for like something like Instagram, that's going to be fellow students. Um, it's definitely going to be more likely. Uh, students within your own school or uh, competing teams that are trying to locate you. So your the types of posts that you're doing can be a little bit more fun and the type of stuff that you um, maybe would share with a friend. Uh, when it's stuff like Facebook and uh, LinkedIn, um, those are definitely much older audiences, um, but those are also probably where you're going to find donors or uh, parents that are interested in your program. So try to find ways of sharing like uh, some of the outreach events that you do or the charity work that you do. That's going to be great for Facebook and Instagram or not Instagram, uh, LinkedIn. Um, if you do have great videos, uh, definitely do YouTube because everybody prefers to watch videos than to read something. Um, but it just depends upon whether or not you uh, have the means to, to film video and edit it. Right. You know? And really only if they're short videos. Yeah. Because you, you know, 10 minutes, too much. Two right. and a half minutes, much better. Right. So things right. like that. Um, no, I think that that's fantastic. And, you know, we're not saying go out and dismantle all of your current accounts. Please don't do that. But it would be wise to make sure that your name, like in any of the editable areas, right. is you know very obviously associated with your community. And for the rookie teams moving forward, who hasn't created these social media sites, and we would really appreciate if you like made your Twitter 
so that we can communicate with you and tag you in photos during mm -hmm. our events since Indiana First is typically very um, active on Twitter during those times. Um, you know, thinking about using something more like the community oriented name versus your team number that might help uh, your, your community find you mm -hmm. and engage with you a little bit more. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so let's continue on, Chris, to the next slide. Um, so I think this is kind of going back to those branding tips and best practices, um, you know, where we talk about like removing limits and being creative. Yep. So we already covered that. And then um, doing the opposite. Mm -hmm. Correct. And then the last one was that keeping things fresh, so adapting and changing. I think that kind of tied back to, you know, using those themes yeah. a little bit. So kind of the example that we had here with 708. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the other thing to consider is that a lot of your judges are, at least from what I have seen in the two or three years that I've volunteered, um, there are a lot of the same judges every year. So if your shirt looks exactly the same from last year, they probably won't be super excited about your brand um, if that is an award that you're trying to target. Um, so try to keep things fresh because if you're bored with what you're doing, uh, everybody else is definitely going to be bored with what you're doing. Um, so try to keep it fun, try to do things that keep you engaged about it. Um, and in particular, if you can tie it in with uh, like this year's space theme, um, you know, even better. This is probably, this is actually from uh, 2015. Sometimes you try to forget it. It's Recycle Rush. So it was the stacking oh, one. Okay. Um, so this Cheesy Poofs, they kind of listed all their sponsors, um, but you, they, did, they added this to the back. And so it was kind gotcha. of an opportunity for them to do a little bit of tweaking with their standard brand and go from there. So, um, all right, so if we go back to the PowerPoint slides, I think I did some first specific resources that we could talk a little bit okay. about before we move into questions. So Chris, if we want to swap back to the PowerPoint slide, you're doing a great job. Oh, so like you've mentioned, I was really glad when we were talking um, and setting this up, you mentioned the Cheesy Poofs yep. because they have this amazing um, you know, resource where teams can go on their website and actually look at their branding guidelines where they include things like all the color palettes that they use with the different, you know, hex codes and things like that, mm -hmm. um, how the swoosh can be utilized. So that's what the little, um, when you're looking at their logo, that little C that they have. So yeah. that's, they call that the swoosh. Um, and then also, you know, topography, they had mentioned that as well. And so when we were going over that as a company, I was really excited because I was like, oh, look at like the teams, you know, I've seen branding guidelines from a first point of view. I've rarely like officially looked for branding guidelines for other companies. And so to see like teams using them and companies using them and how like representative they are, I was, I was very excited about that. Yeah. And I will say that if um, your team is up for that award and there is a judge that um, has more of a marketing background or any sort of design background and you've done this type of work where you have um, you know, your own brand guidelines either in like a document form that you can hand to a judge or you can point them to a website where all of this stuff lives. Um, that shows that you've put a lot of thought into it and it's really impressive from our end. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think you know, another good example, you had mentioned earlier about having you know, Renaissance, they have a like, this is how you can use your logo with mm -hmm. different colors and backgrounds. And so Team Neutrino, you know, they actually kind of created the similar model and what was really funny is, you know, typically teams, if you are below a 3,000 number, um, a lot of times you would use maybe your team number to kind of be identified. Mm -hmm. um, it's also one of the ways you get like selected uh, during the events. And so team numbers, are, you know, are important to some extent. Mm -hmm. However, Team Neutrino really wanted to focus on like their name and their logo. Right. as being a identifier. And I know all of this because I have good friends who kind of created the branding gotcha. and they've shared, shared this with me. But um, so they really tried to like minimize the fact that, you know, their, their team number, they've made it a lot smaller. They made their name kind of their big thing. And so people know them by Neutrino. I can't remember their team number. Mm -hmm. I just know to call them that. And one of the cool things is, is that they've created a logo that can be used you know, either on, you know, a black shirt or on a, you know, a lighter colored shirt. And mm -hmm. so they've kind of exchanged the logo that way and defined it. But then they also have like Lego League, when they do cross program engagement, they have Quirk and, uh, you know, Proton related branding as well that they've tried to tie into their larger 
larger groups, which is kind of a neat, weird aspect. So that, that is kind of cool that like they're um, like subsidiary teams like seem like they're cohesively part of the group. Um, and I know that earlier I said that like your best option is to have a, a logo that's a single color. And I know that this doesn't seem like an example of that, but if you were to make this logo into um, one solid color, it, it could work. And so try to, something like this is good because it's super simple and it's easy to, to remember. Um, once you see it, you instantly recognize it. So try to go for that if you can. And I'd say my rule of thumb when I, t when I work with teams is um, do you print in two colors on the front. Mm -hmm. So um, you can get three colors by having the shirt back a different color. Yeah. But print on two colors on the front. And then when you do the back of a team shirt, you know, do a one color back. Because then, you know, it's kind of simple, easy more cost effective. It's also cheaper. Yes. And so, so yeah. that's always really nice, but that's kind of a good trick is like, yeah. you can only work with three colors and you, any more, it gets really complicated. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds great. Okay. So let's go to our next example of a resource. I think it's exploding bacons back to the PowerPoints. There we go. Um, so um, Exploding Bacon, because of their imagery mm -hmm. and their logo, they have been doing this for quite a long time. You know, they are team number, I don't even remember because I should know them as Exploding Bacon, 1902. There we go, check their t-shirt. Um, and so they've actually done a number of workshops on branding and imagery. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have a number of resources on their website that teams can take a look at. Um, they can actually actually see a webinar even. Um, but so that, that is a specific resource that the teams could take a look at as well related to those, uh, those teams. So what's, um, this I just noticed, but what's also cool about their name and kind of what they've thought about with this is I didn't initially realize that it's tied to 4-H. So mm -hmm. even though it's like just a fun name, it also kind of shows like some intentionality in the fact that like they're partnered with 4-H, which is traditionally associated with livestock and things like that. So it's kind of like a tongue in cheek sort of reference to yes. the fact that they deal with bacon. And and so. they include the 4-H logo on the bake on the pig. Yep. Slash pig. But yes. Um, and I, it's probably one of the reasons that they're they're potentially a green color. But you should find out more about that by checking out the resource because I don't know if that's true. Gotcha. So, um, so yeah, so those are some of the first specific resources that teens and our rookies can check out. Um, I think that those are kind of the main points, key yeah. areas. And so, you know, teens at this point, if you guys have any specific questions, you know, we have time now for you guys to talk, you know, kind of ask the expert here um, for a few suggestions or comments. So, I don't know. Cue I feel like silence. I know. I'm like I should have, should have uh, you know, seeded a question there. So uh, I don't know if. Uh, hold on. Oh. No worries. I shut the audio off on. The, oh. On the teams, I muted them. And so they can unmute themselves if they want, if they have a question, but we also have the chat available. Cool. So teams, if you have any questions, now is the time. We are As recording tonight's session. We're gonna be putting it out on the resources page uh, on the Indiana First website, along with the uh, PowerPoint slides so that people can have those links. Absolutely. So, uh, Jason, during your time in the first program, are there any other like Indiana specific brands that you've kind of seen and have been really impressed with? Like the other, like any particular teams? That, yeah, just like um, come, come to top of mind because really any that come to top of mind, there's someone that, that you've kind of noticed as, as that. Oh, we, do have, uh, we do have a question. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how hard is it to change a logo or slash rebrand a team? Uh, a team or a company? I can speak to how hard it is for a company. That's um, a good place to start. Yeah, this is this is I'm sure just in, you know, uh, to a team, but yeah. Um, so my recommendation and kind of like condensing down like what it's like from from a company like 
a design doesn't like just happen with a single person kind of coming up with a doodle and then everybody saying like that doodle is awesome we should just do that doodle um what are when when we re redesigned our logo uh two or three years ago um that meant the graphic designer um really looked at what our competitors were doing um looked at uh, you know, different favorite brands that we liked for inspiration, uh, tried to find like different ways of um, really representing the company in a logo. Um, so there were something like 50 to 100 different versions of our logo that all died and we just ended up with the one that we had. Um, so my recommendation is if you're coming up with a new logo or coming up with a new design, um, come up with, even if you like one, um, even if you start out and you're like, I love this one, we should just do this one, come up with another 15 or 20 just to see like where um, kind of that brainstorming takes you because that those other designs might inform a better version of the one that you like. Um, I think that initially... Uh, like our logo was a really basic starburst and we were trying to find ways of like turning that into a compass or things like that to make it seem like it's tied to Renaissance. Um, what we ended up doing was uh, making kind of a starburst out of uh, the letter R kind of repeated. Um, it, you can kind of see that in our logo. Um, so it sometimes like weird ideas come out when you do a bunch of variations and so don't settle on just one um, but as far as like coming up with something new uh, it, it can be a challenge but I would just recommend you know not leaving it to one person making sure that it's a team effort and and don't assume that it's just like your media or design team's job like get people that have been like seniors and have always been like they're the engineer or they're the, the programmer and they've been there for four years and they've only done this particular job. They may have more insight into what uh, the design of the logo should be than you might as a, a rookie. Um, so make sure that you involve people that are outside of like, uh, you know, the creative types. Well, and one of the things that we talked about during our prep for the mm -hmm. webinar was that, you know, you don't have to be stuck with the uh, design that you created six years ago. Right. So keeping it fresh, I think, was the point. So, yeah. yeah. And, and that's also to say, like, even if you refresh kind of like your branding to be tied to uh, whatever the theme of first is that particular year, like if your logo was designed six, seven years ago, and your entire team has graduated since then, um, and no one's particularly in love or excited with that, that logo or that branding, that is an opportunity to readdress it and, and try something new, try something that's exciting for you. Absolutely. And I also think it's important, you know, if you stay with a similar color pattern or mm -hmm. color palette, that is a really easy way to kind of like update your brand while making sure people are like, oh, I'm looking for, you know, if Cyber Blue is going to do a different branding or logo, I am looking for blue because they were, you know, Cyber Blue. And yeah. so if there was a rebrand going on there in terms of a logo, I, you know, I would be expecting to find blue, for instance. Yeah. Um, so, so that would be kind of a recommendation with maybe don't, don't, please don't go to like red or purple. That would be a little bit too much of a jump. Yeah. <laughs> and that, yeah, and some of our, some of yeah. our teams is, uh, depending on how closely tied to the school they are, may have to play by school rules. Uh, right. We do have another question. What tips do you have for staying consistent so that you can be easily recognized and known while still being fresh year over year? <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I, I would say, like, um, if you are... So say like you have a, a very basic color palette that's like um, red or white or blue or white, um, just thinking of different team colors and um, you're kind of consistently those colors and you have a very consistent logo um, and you're wanting to do something different 
Um, so like, let's, let's bring up uh, Cheesy Puffs uh, shirt. So they have like the basic blue and white and they have that swoosh. Um, and that's probably on like all of their materials. If they wanted to do something different, you could um, find a way to like put the swoosh in some other location or integrate it into some other logo or be it a symbol on like, so say like the, the theme this year was like superhero themed, you could take the swoosh and make that like the belt buckle of like uh, a superhero costume or something like that. And you could turn like 254 into like, uh, kind of like the Superman logo or something like, like that. Like there are ways that you can kind of break down the individual pieces of what your consistent branding is, like your, your main branding is, and kind of adapt it to whatever the, the new theme is. So it still feels like it references what you used to be, um, but is still fresh and there's still something new about it. Sure. And, you know, and you can tell me your feedback on this thought, but a lot of times when I work with teams, um, I'll kind of, you know, I'll have them do the two color front, one color back sort of rule with the different color, you know, being a shirt. So you get three colors or two colors in there. Um, but then also, you know, keeping a brand consistent and making sure it's large, able to be seen from far away. Um, but then keeping it a consistent sort of, you know, standard logo and color scheme but also maybe having like a Thursday fun shirt. Mm -hmm. Like that could be an opportunity yeah. where, you know, Andy Mark, they're not changing their logo. Like this is the back of the Andy Mark shirt. Like their logo isn't changing. Like their colors right. are standard, but they're doing this really fun. One second. Oh, where's the shoulder? There we go. Uh, rocket. And they're kind of adding to their Andy Mark logo with that theme. Mm -hmm. And so this was kind of a way that teams have kind of incorporated that. And I wish I didn't put so much stuff on this quilt of t-shirts because I have, um, you know, Pewaukee is a team from, well, they're probably Paradigm Shift. They're from uh, Wisconsin. And they actually redo their logo to encompass different aspects of the theme, but they keep it really, you know, kind of consistent gotcha. with the colors and then the general design of the logo each year. And so that's been kind of a cool way that teams can work on that as well. Yeah. Uh, another, like a, another real world example that I might give is, um, look at different companies that uh, like do something different with their logo or with their branding uh, during December because everyone kind of adapts to like the holiday shopping season and you see like, like your brand colors could be like brown and orange and white in the case of like Amazon, but you might do something where like your logo is red, white, and green um, because it's the holiday season. So there, there are times that you can play with it. It's just um, try to keep a few elements of whatever uh, your original branding was. And that way it still feels fresh, but it feels consistently fresh. Like it still feels like a part of your original brand. Sure. All right, team, so think of any other questions, but I had a question okay. for you. Um, were there any like main favorite parts of the new brand that Renaissance has that you really liked? Um, so the big thing for me was, uh, um, and I kind of touched on this, we have a lot of illustrations on our website, um, like these little cartoony superheroes that are all over the place. Um, that is my favorite part of our brand. Um, Kind of like what I said, we are a software company that mainly deals with dentistry, um, which is not a super exciting uh, uh, marketplace. Um, if you look at most software companies in that space, like I said, it's a lot of just basic screenshots. They look like uh, the website for a lawyer or something. Uh, it's just like very plain and boring. Um, and I'm sure that that's the experience that a lot of <laughs> yeah, there, there's an example of like our, our illustration style. So um, as, a, as a way to set ourselves apart from uh, all these other companies that do like really boring basic stuff, we wanted to try to do something different. And so that's why we did all the illustrations. Um, so as far as like my favorite thing, it's the fact that we chose something really weird uh, for the dental space. Um, we didn't 
just do something basic that everybody else was doing. Sure. And so Chris, if you go back to build, um, there is a sub area that has icons. And so oh, when I, mean, I was looking at your brand, yeah. I loved like some of these icons that you had. And one of the things that you had mentioned was using icon font, font awesome. Is that, mm -hmm. what is that? Is that the indie font or what? Um, I wasn't sure what that it was. It was so is, cool. font awesome is, so that is like, if you scroll up, um, most of these are drawn, hand drawn by our uh, graphic designer, but right below, like scroll down just a little bit. So that is font awesome, those tiny icons. Oh. Um, it is uh, a way of getting very basic uh, icons. Um, like the little house, the calculator, the planner. Um, the, the big thing is, is when you do uh, layouts and you want icons, um, if you do them in JPEG, uh, they turn ugly really quickly when you make mm -hmm. them large. Mm -hmm. um, the great thing about fonts are, fonts are based in, in vector, which means that it's more, it's the size and everything, the layout of it is based in math and not like, a picture. So when you resize it, it scales and it doesn't lose any of its integrity. Um, so an easy way of doing that is there's a font called Font Awesome that has a bunch of icons in it. I didn't know that. And that's um, amazing. Um, so with that in mind, is it good for teams to remember to have like it, copies of their logo that are not in JPEG but are in maybe PNG format? Yeah. So if you are like that, that's a good example of like if you're trying to order a shirt um, and you want your logo to look decent, um, make sure that you have a copy of your logo in something like a PNG um, because that's probably how they're going to print your logo. Um, things like a JPEG, which is probably the most common um, uh, like image format for the web is like uh, very pixelated when you get a much bigger. Um, so that's not going to translate well to print. It's great for a website because it doesn't take up a lot of space. Um, so just, yeah, like make sure that whatever you're providing to a printer is like a good quality image, I guess. That's good advice. That's very good advice. So there, there was a question about uh, who designs your brands and logos. Is it someone in-house or do you hire a company? Um, it is. So all of the stuff for um, our Renaissance brand is was designed in-house. Uh, we, uh, at the time, had hired uh, a, a brand specialist who had previously worked for uh, groups like Martha Stewart. Um, she had done some work for uh, IHOP as well, um, kind of designing some of their product lines. Um, so when she came on, she was responsible for uh, really designing our logo and everything like that. Um, you can, and a, plenty of companies do this, will reach out to um, marketing firms. Um, there's plenty in town that are like that, that uh, uh, will do that work for you. It's just whether or not you have the resources available to you. Um, that is to say that um, really at, on like the student level, if you're like in a team, like you can design your logo. Don't spend money on having someone else do it. Mm -hmm. um, best case, you can find someone within the community that uh, does marketing that you can talk to that can kind of coach you through the process or reach out to the art department of your, your school. There is probably someone that has some design background or can help coach you through that process. Cool. I love the idea because you're engaging the community and you're finding new potential mentors mm -hmm. in a sub area that can always use some extra support. Yep. I think that's great. Yep. What's okay. your advice for balancing professionalism and being silly slash fun? Um, I, the, well, the example would be, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my company. Um, so the, the big thing is, um, I think in most cases, you can be silly slash fun, and it is uh, respected by whoever is um, accessing those materials. Yeah, like stuff like that. Um, if you're, you know, a potential customer, or if in the case of like, 
um, someone that's donating money to you, like there is something to be said of if your brand looks fun, people want to have fun. So that is more inviting than something that is a little bit more um, cut and dry. Um, but as far as like balancing professionalism, um, I think that the line is more in how you communicate and, and that's more like my responsibility in, in my company. If, if what you're delivering to someone is uh, some super serious message like, hey, um, your bill is past due or hey, um, we're terminating this service because we're no longer offer, offering this product line that may not be the time that you include an illustration of a superhero with it. And that might not be a time that like you include language that is uh, a little bit cheekier and kind of references um, superheroes or things like that. Uh, it's just kind of a time and a place sort of thing. Like if, if it's just a potential customer and you're trying to sell them something, or if you're trying to promote in your case, um, how awesome first is and potentially donating money or mm -hmm. things like that. I think keeping it, uh, friendly and lighthearted is great. If it's something where you're trying to write a thank you note to someone, um, like a potential donor, um, that would be a time that you actually want to go the professional route and you want to, um, seem more thoughtful, uh, and just, be a, a very direct, like, just thank you for your service and blah, blah, blah. Thank you. We really appreciate the, the amount of money that you gave our team, that sort of thing. Um, it's just kind of a use your best judgment. Um, usually, if you have to ask whether or not it's appropriate, uh, the answer is no. <laughs> right. Well, and um, a lot of times teams will ask that question, like, you know, we have, you know, we have our rookies here. And so, you know, next year they'll be doing chairman's uh, mm -hmm. interviews. And so, um, you know, for, for what I tell teams, I've worked with, I've worked with many teams um, back in the day on their chairman's awards. Um, and so over, you know, essentially, I worked with five different teams that won chairman's awards, well, five different chairman's awards, four different teams in about a three year period before mm -hmm. I moved to Indiana. And so actually, if you move a little bit this way, um, Alter Protection Squad, UPS, my alumni team, uh, they would go into the chairman's room. You can move back now. Oh, okay. uh, they could move into the chairman's room uh, dressed up as superheroes, literally. Right. Um, and they had capes um, and they would talk about, they like literally walked in with like two people. They were superheroes. They had a villain come in and it was like a skit. Mm -hmm. um, and so the skit went through like this villain was like, oh, like you are not superheroes. You do not do these amazing things. And they're like, but we do. And like, it was kind of really corny and campy and fun. Mm -hmm. um, and so the kids had a good time. Uh, you know, they were able to kind of earn that word. But I've also worked with teens who wanted to be a lot more professional. That was what their brand was about. And they also did really well, too. Uh, so it just kind of depends on, from my point of view, what your students feel most comfortable with um, and what you as mentors, how you want to engage those students, too. Yeah, I, I guess for that, like, particular example, I would say just, like, it's really kind of a knowing yourself sort of situation. Mm -hmm. If if who's responsible for your chairman's presentation are, um, you know, they're part of your forensics team or speech team or things like that, um, they're probably going to be the types that may be a little bit more serious and they might want to go in there in suits and things like that. And that is impressive on its own. Like if if you're like super professional and it's like this uh, really well-written speech and, and you want to do it in a suit, that's great. And that, that will come off really positive. If you're like, if your chairman's group is more of the theater geeks and you're they could like do Hamilton. super, you could do something like that. Um, but if you're maybe a little bit more theatrical in your, your presentation and you uh, want to do something like that superhero theme, uh, that's great too. It's just whether or not you're comfortable doing that. Um, I wouldn't put someone that is great at just doing uh, really great public speaking, um, who is more comfortable in a suit and in front of a lectern uh, in a superhero costume and hope that they perform really well. And I wouldn't put someone that 
loves joking and being really zany in a suit and hope that they're comfortable in that. So just decide what you're most comfortable with. Um, that will probably work to your benefit. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you so much for all your time and teams. Thank you for tuning in. You know, we're going to be posting this on our resource page um, so that other teams can kind of tune in and check it out. And we hope that you guys, you know, find it helpful and useful. So thank you so much. So Chris, if you want to start, re stop recording, that sounds good. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.